I'll first mention that uh, Tom is a member of the Iowa Association for Justice. They recognize the Brain Injury Alliance for um, its work in getting the concussion legislation going in 2011 and also with the REAP program, but I should say that there's not an event more significant than what Tom was able to unfold with the research and the landmark million dollar Iowa School District case. We knew that when we got the concussion legislation on deck in 2011, everybody would have kind of polite consideration for brain injury and concussion, but it, when that first lawsuit hit, then all the risk managers were going to go, oh, this is something we should pay attention to, so thank you. Um, he did lead uh, that, that landmark million dollar Iowa School District settlement around youth concussion, and today he's going to share some of the state of preparation, or lack thereof in Iowa, and the steps that, be, that can be taken to prevent um, bad outcomes, negative health outcomes for students, and negative legal outcomes for districts and professionals. Um, Tom's got some initial slides he's going to go through, and then we're going to um, kind of shift to a bit of a question and answer panel presentation style. So without ado, thank you for, he just got off a plane about an hour and a half ago from D.C., so <laughs> thank you for coming so quickly. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, I start off with the Stroh case, and I want to tell you just a little bit about the Stroh case before I, I go further, because there, there has been some, some case law development in the area of concussion in, uh, in school activities. But, but I want to start with the Stroh case because, first of all, how, how many of you have ever been on a jury? How many of you have served on a jury? Yeah. Nobody? Okay, all right. Well, the Stroh case is significant because the Stroh case was about 12 people who got together and considered Iowa Code 280.13c and decided that at least one individual in the chain of the administration at the Bedford, Bedford Community School District did not act reasonably, and that was the school nurse, all right? And the stroke case, after you take everything out, stands for the proposition that if you're an administrator, if you're a coach, if you're an athletic director, if you're a nurse, if you're a school board member, you are expected to act reasonably under the circumstances. And what does that mean? Well, that means essentially that you are to comply with the provisions of uh, Iowa Code Section 280.13c. It's just that simple. One of the things that the court considered in Stroh was whether or not those folks in the chain, and I call it the chain because I look at student athletes participating in school activities to constitute a team approach. And there are a variety of personnel involved in that team approach. There are administrators, there are, or there are uh, school board members, there are administrators, there are coaches, uh, there are nurses, uh, there are assistant coaches, there are volunteers. And all those people have a role in that team. And one of the things that the court had to consider was whether or not certain members of that team have a what's called a fiduciary relationship or a fiduciary duty to the student athlete. And in this case, the Stroh case, what the court held essentially as a matter of law is that there weren't enough facts that were presented to establish a fiduciary relationship between the school district or any of its employees and the student athlete in, in our case. But the court did find and was open to the prospect that the school nurse, because the school nurse was essentially in the role of a treating health care provider, would have a fiduciary relationship. And the reason I say that is because uh, in, in this area, if you're found to have a fiduciary relationship, your duties elevate. All right. The other thing that the court was asked to consider, and this is very important here, was whether or not the statute 28013C, and you're all familiar with that. It's it, you, you see it in the pamphlet, the head up, the heads up, uh, the heads up sheet that you have uh, the parents and the student mm -hmm. athlete review and sign and go over. Uh, it's it's the law, 
Um, the, the question is whether or not the legislature intended that statute to create a cause of action. And, and, and what I mean by that, it's important because if the legislature had intended 280.13c to constitute a private cause of action, then a simple violation of that law would raise the specter of liability of the individual who violated the law. It could be a coach, it could be uh, an administrator, it could be a nurse, it could be anybody. But the court held that the legislature in Iowa did not intend a private cause of action to be created. So ultimately, what it is left with is coaches, trainers, nurses are required to act in a reasonable manner, similar to how others similarly situated are to act. And so what does that mean in the context of your role on that team? Well, 12 people, after applying 28013C, found that the nurse in this case was negligent. And that raised this whole aura, I think, of under what circumstances can schools be held liable. Um, I go back, recently in 2017, <coughs> there was a case called Swank versus Valley Christian. I don't know if you're familiar with it. If you're not, I would suggest you look at it because Swank involved a law similar to Iowa's. Uh, Washington has a concussion law called the Zachary Leistead Law. And in that case, and, and, and the Zachary Leistead law is similar to 280.13c. Uh, 280, uh, and the court was confronted there with the question of whether or not the law created a private cause of action. And the Washington Supreme Court held that it did. All right? Now, here's what I think may come down the pipe. I think eventually the Iowa courts will be asked to decide a similar issue. In Stroh, it was the federal court judge, actually a federal court magistrate, deciding that issue. It wasn't an Iowa court judge or the Iowa Supreme Court. And I think it's significant because I believe that eventually what's going to happen in Iowa is you're going to have um, you're going to have a student athlete who suffers a concussion and everybody may have acted reasonably under the circumstances, but there may have been a provision of a law that was violated that would give rise to a cause would give rise to a cause of action if in fact there's a private cause of action. So I, I, I bring this up just for the purpose of, of, of informing you what I believe is, is coming down the pike. Since, because science has evolved in the area of concussion, successive concussions, leading to traumatic brain injuries, uh, the, the, the litigation spectrum has just exploded, mm -hmm. all right? And, and, and again, uh, the reason I asked about <clears throat> whether or not you'd ever served on a jury because more and more, you're getting you're getting these kinds of cases where where uh, where where student athletes are injured as a result of suffering a concussion in an athletic event, and because they are informed of their rights, the question is who, if anybody, is liable? And there has become, I think, emerging a real dilemma uh, on the part of school districts sponsors of these these athletic events as to what to do on the one hand to protect the student athlete and then on the other hand how do you protect your own liability what do you do to ensure that the student athlete is protected but on the other hand what do you do to guard against potential liability and that's what's happening on the horizon today um, i think that all, all I really wanted to do with this is there are a number of cases that have uh, come through the courts uh, over the years, and I think that the theme, the theme that all of them have is if you're a coach, if you're a nurse, if you're an administrator, you are required to act reasonably under the circumstances. 
Now, as science has evolved and legislatures are getting more involved in the topic of, topic of concussion in sports activities and school activities, legislation is passed. And as I said in Stroh, and as I, as I pointed out in the Swain case, the question is, does this legislation suggest or merely provide evidence of how coaches and nurses and administrators and school districts are to act? Or do they actually create a right or a remedy on the part of the student athlete to recover damages if they're injured as a result of a concussion? In the uh, Cerny case, that was a Nebraska case, 2004, ancient history for all intents and purposes. And in that case, the, that, this is long before return to play ever came into the forefront. And in that case, the coach actually had a coaching certificate and he had a coaching endorsement. He was a certified, he had a teaching certificate with a coaching endorsement. And in that case, he allowed the student athlete to return into the very same game he had suffered a concussion in. And that case actually started in 2001, it was tried once, there was a defense verdict. It went up to the Nebraska Supreme Court. The Nebraska Supreme Court set it back down. Tried again, another defense verdict. Nebraska Supreme Court held in 2004 that there are essentially four elements of what coaches are required to be familiar with. They're required to be familiar with the features of a concussion. And that was back in 2004, that's 13 years ago. They were required to evaluate the player who appeared to have suffered the head injury for symptoms of a concussion. They were required to repeat evaluation at intervals before the player would be permitted to re-enter the game. Now that's significant because you would never have that today. You would never have a student athlete injured in a football game be allowed to re-enter that game if it had been determined that that player had suffered a concussion. But in 2004, that's where the science was. And then ultimately to determine based upon evaluation serious of, seriousness of injury and whether it was appropriate to let the player re-enter the game or remove the player from all contact pending medical examination. A lot of lawyers believe that Cerny, even though it was a Nebraska case, sort of paved the way for a lot of the concussion legislation that you see in all 50 states mm -hmm. today. All of them have it. Um, this case, uh, it's an Illinois case, and I can't pronounce the plaintiff's name. Basically, uh, it, 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 it is a 2015 case, and in Illinois, the plaintiff attempted to go much further than what you see currently. Um, the, the plaintiff in that case asked the court to declare uh, that the uh, Cook County or that the uh, school district, the, or not the school district, but the uh, Illinois High School Athletic Association was negligent in failing to enact additional concussion policy protections including requiring doctors or medical personnel to be present at all high school events at all levels of participation. Um, that there would also be testing for mandatory concussion baseline testing for all student athletes and a medical monitoring fund that would pay for athletes injured in sporting events. Essentially a strict liability. So what the plaintiff in, in this case, the Pearson of that case, was attempting to, to, to ask the Illinois District Court to hold was any time an athlete is injured as a result of suffering concussion in a high school or a high school, I think it was 7 to 12 in Illinois, any time they should be able to recover damages for that. Illinois District Court said, no, we're not going to uh, go that far. Uh, the association's current policy conforming with applicable Illinois concussion law and standards of medical care in the evaluation and treatment of concussions sufficed. So you see an attempt, at least in the state of Illinois, to take concussion law liability a step further. And that's because the science is evolving. 
uh, as, as people become more informed and more aware of the science, you'll see lawyers like me. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'll tell you, I, and I, 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 I want to tell you this because I'm a plaintiff's trial lawyer, but I have many friends and acquaintances who are educators, who are coaches, uh, who are involved in high school athletics, and I can tell you that their concern about the expanding liability in, 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 in high school sports, uh, and not only high school sports, organizational sports that precede the seventh grade. I mean, I get calls from parents who have kids involved in peewee football, and uh, they're wondering whether or not they may have a potential claim because their kid has suffered a concussion or a serious injury as a result of participating in a peewee football game. Uh, soccer is another heavy, huge uh, potential for concussion liability. And so the dilemma that exists in this particular area of the law is really frightening. You don't want, if you're an administrator, you don't want to be mean. You don't want to be on the other end of a plaintiff's lawyer who one of his student, one of his student, one of the coach's students that student athlete suffers a concussion in a football game, and we pull out all the stops. We're going to interview all 55 members of your football team and their parents. Uh, we're going to take depositions of every student or every teacher. We're going to spend money on experts coaches, neuropsychologists, neurologists, neurosurgeons, and frankly, will make your life hell. So what I, what I try to tell people when I'm speaking to groups like this is when in doubt, hold them out, okay? I mean, really. Um, let me, let me ask a quick question on, based on that slide. Oops. Let me yeah, go back to that. that. Yeah. I just want to get back to my Would last. Would you represent us against the families that want their kids to come back in when the doctor says they're okay to come back in, but everything today says it ought to be at least 30 days? Everything I've heard today tells mm. us at least 30 days, and yet no one has that as a part of the law. It just says any medical provider can allow you to go back in. So this is the same question. Let me let me see if I can paraphrase that into a separate piece. Not that he would represent you, but I just if the standard of care in Iowa today, we just heard that the REAP manual, if you haven't heard, has been sent to every school administrator in Iowa by the Department of Education, Department of Health, and, and the Brain Injury Alliance has sent the REAP manual saying this is endorsed by these three agencies. It's not it's not the statute but it's standard of care, suggested standard of care. And in addition, you heard today that the departments have been, have, are releasing these concussion guidelines for educators, again, reinforcing that. Would that rise to the level that now a reasonable or similar person might be operating from that, in your opinion? Yes. Uh, I, I, I think I think this whole area is evolving. The science is evolving. But I think the science has evolved much faster than the law has evolved. So you're not seeing the duties imposed that the science seems to require. So if you're, if you're talking about a return to play protocol that is graduated, that logically speaking takes you out 30 days, and that's what the science says. You may have coaches acting under maybe perhaps scientific principles that were maybe years old, three years old, right. and you could have those coaches, those school districts, those administrators be found to have acted as reasonable professionals under similar circumstances. However, once you begin to inform and educate, right. then the at least the standards 
begin to catch up with the science. And so now you have fewer coaches adhering to the previous science, more coaches adhering to the current science, and you have 12 jurors now when you're confronted with did a coach who did not employ, or did a school district, let's just be broad about it, did a school district that did not uh, establish and mandate a graduated return that would take you out 30 days, did they act reasonable under the circumstances? And the science is there, people are informed, you're going to have experts, expert witnesses come in, and they're going to testify, yes, this is the standard of care. You're going to have coaches come in. They're going to say, yes, this is the standard of care. You're going to have nurses come in. Yes, this is the standard of care. And the school district's going to be behind the eight ball. And that's the, real, that's the reality. Yes? I think kind of what Brad was talking about, and, and in our case, we had a student athlete a year ago um, during basketball season, scrimmage, two guys hit heads. He was concussed, went to the doctor. Yes, he was. Um, about six days later, he comes with a note from the doctor that says he's ready to return to play. We do baseline testing on all of our athletes. Our athletic manager or our athletic trainer does a post test. His numbers aren't near what they were on the baseline test. We held him out, and I think what Brad's saying is his parents were pissed because they got an okay from a doctor that said he can go back. And he wasn't a kid that, you know, is probably going on to get a Division One scholarship or whatever. But like in Brad's case at Valley High School, you, you take his offensive guard out of the game for four weeks and he may be going to get an Iowa scholarship or somewhere now you're talking about parents that are not happy about that thing mm -hmm. even though we're following mm -hmm. the guidelines of what we need to be we're probably looking at a lawsuit from the other direction now i defend you on that case well that, that and that's what he's and that's what brad's saying you you'll defend us against that right? i defend you on that case because because here's why because you're acting in conformance with the acceptable standards of your profession in your industry at this moment, okay? Mm -hmm. The other reason I wouldn't take the case is because I think, you know, and I read a lot about, I read a lot about, about cases where, you know, you deprive a student athlete of, of the opportunity to achieve a higher level of success. I think that those cases are far too speculative in terms of the damages, you know? So that's another reason why you won't find a lot of plaintiff's lawyers get involved in a case like that. So I defend you on that case. I, I, I and I, I would stand pretty I would stand pretty strong on that. I wouldn't you know I mean we don't have a lot of issues with just to make sure everybody understands here. Coaches don't want to play kids with broken arms or brain injuries. That's really kind of an old myth, I think, at least in our area. I think that what they want to do is make sure they get the best care and they're asking, you know, how do what do we do different now? Mm -hmm. Both preventative then post concussion to make sure kids really are okay mm -hmm. in the classroom, in, in 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 sports. No one's rushing anybody back to play. There's too many. There's enough kids. I and, think and winning's winning's not enough of a motive. It, it's to, a societal. It's rush. a societal and institutional dilemma mm -hmm. that you're in. You know. What I'm worried about is the ones we don't know about. So a kid plays mm -hmm. club soccer mm -hmm. and plays high school soccer, and we don't know he had a concussion in club soccer, and no one wants to tell us. Right. So how, what, what concussion number is this? You know, right. and even if you don't do a pretest, you got to treat each concussion like you know you got to go. You can you can test them when that concussion happens. If their scores are low, right. they can't go back in anyway. But I mean, I do worry sometimes about mm -hmm. some people are really afraid to even put their kids in athletics, and other people want their kids in no matter what. And it's really kind of a, you really got both pendulums. You know? Well, I think. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, I wanted to say something adding on to what you were talking about, you know, this healthcare professional that released this child. So I'm a nurse practitioner, I work in the child's concussion clinic. And often I think a problem with the 
Iowa state law is that it says any health care provider can release uh, an athlete but to return to play. The problem with that is not every health care provider is specialized in concussion management and brain injury. It could be a family practice doctor, it could be a doctor that doesn't specialize in that. So there, I think the future of the law is that it needs to be more of a specifically trained, specialized brain injury practitioner, athletic trainer that has special training in that. We often get kids in our clinic seven days, 14 days post-injury, and they were, the, their PCP just said go home and rest. And research, we know research now says you're not supposed to sit in a dark room for seven days, that you're actually supposed to engage in some light like, cognitive activity and physical activity. So I think the future of the law will be that there, and to help release pressure off you guys, athletic trainer, coaches, there probably does need to be some type of specialized medical trained professional at every high school football game. Or well, what about during practice? Right. I mean, th but that comes with like state funding. I mean, they're only going to fund the big games. They're probably not going to initially fund like a, at a middle school level. You know, it's going to be at high school level and you have an actual nurse practitioner, MD, somebody that's more specific so the pressure isn't on it on you guys that that is not the law now today though. it's not i know but i'm wondering if it will go to that. well it, it, it may but it, it may because the science may evolve to the point where uh where it requires somebody with highly specialized knowledge to actually evaluate a person with a concussion you know you don't have you, with all due respect to athletic trainers, you don't have athletic trainers in professional sports evaluating patient or uh, uh, athletes on the sideline unless it's in conjunction with a board certified neurologist right. for a concussion. So it may go that way, right. but again, I we're we are we are in the throes of a societal and institutional dilemma with respect to <clears throat> concussion and activities and high school sports, just all sports, but particularly high school sports, because the question is whether or not uh, uh, school districts like, like Bedford have the resources. Right. Uh, and if they don't have the resources, what do they do? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a problem. Yes? Did I understand that in, in the Illinois case, what they were wanting is that regardless uh, of what the outcome on, or regardless of when they were returned to play, that if you were injured, they were seeking the ability for anybody who got injured to sue the, the district, even if all the protocol was followed. Is yes. That, yes, because 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 it's crazy. because well because because the part it, participating in certain sports constitutes an inherently dangerous activity, and if it's inherently right if it's inherently dangerous then the argument is is that if it's inherently dangerous and the district know or that the Iowa or the Illinois High School Athletic Association knows it's inherently dangerous they ought to compensate anybody who is injured as a result of that that's not the law that's way out there now but but uh, of course now you there can be an argument that football, for example, or soccer are inherently dangerous activities. Um, I, I, I can, I, I'm trying. I, I would try and give you my thoughts as to what the current state of the law means, and I think how how best, if you're a district, a school district, you can protect yourself and ensure that your student athletes are protected. First of all, you have to establish and require adherence to reasonable guidelines and procedures in management of concussions which include graduated steps to achieve clearance to return to play. Now, if there's some debate about how long the stepwise program before you return to play might be, if there's some dispute in science, and you've got support for maybe a lesser graduated program, then it's fine, in my estimation, as long as you establish and require adherence to that guideline. I think what courts primarily look to is, does the district 
had guidelines. Iowa, in Iowa, you're required to establish guidelines. Districts are required to establish guidelines. And you've got to do that. And I think that if you do that, that's one of the things you can do. Reasonable training for personnel and concussion recognition and management. Now, this gets to a question that you asked about who's qualified. Mm -hmm. I believe, I, my sense is, is that the Iowa legislature, and I think legislatures around the country recognizing the diversity in demographics <clears throat> and the, the lack of resources that some school districts may have, is you can train an athletic trainer to recognize the signs and symptoms of a concussion. And you can establish a, a reasonable programs where these folks are trained. There are a plethora of online and uh, web programs available where you can get the training, you can have certifications, and I think that's the, that's, that's the second thing you can do. The other thing is you have to, if you're at school district, you have to foster an environment of concussion education. And I think that starts at school, at the beginning of the school year, all right? I think it's, 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 it's almost mandatory that if you're convening a first of the year assembly of, of all uh, parents and, and uh, uh, participants in, in school activities, I think you need to educate them as to an environment of concussion-free activity. All right, and then I would also advocate that before the start of a particular athletic season, for example, if you're um, if you're starting uh, uh, basketball and you know you can suffer a concussion in basketball, it's it's a good idea if you're a coach to or you're a district to have a little program where you're again fought it, and it can be it can be anything but at least get out there that you're trying to foster a concussion-free environment and it really begins with information that is distributed, disseminated to the parents and, and the students. The second thing is you have to attempt to foster concussion-free environments. And one of the things in the stroke case that we had was we had a, 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 an environment where there was a lot of horseplay, a lot of bravado. Um, there was um, a lot of uh, what, what I would call uh, conduct that belied the conceptual acknowledgement that physical contact to the head can cause injury. For example, one of the things we found was it was not unusual for a coach to grab a player by the face mask and jerk the helmet. We found that it was not unusual for a player, if they were upset or they were mad, pull her helmet off and slam it down on the ground. We found that, and this was, this was rampant, we found that after a, a great play, there'd be head butts, helmet butts, over and over again. And this was condoned by the community and by the coaches. We also found that there was a lot of horseplay, and when there's horseplay, particularly with respect to creating an environment where, let's say you've got a student athlete who was concussed maybe a week and a half earlier. And now that individual's back on the sideline. But the sideline is such a disorganized mess. The coaches aren't keeping track of those players on the sideline that they're engaged in tossing footballs back and forth and hitting each other in the head and helmet, helmet butting each other and roughhousing to the point now where the kid that was concussed a week and a half ago, he's part of that whole mix, and he suffers another concussion and nobody knows it. That kind of environment, I think, is easy to control <clears throat> if you're a coach or you're a district, school district. 
I also think that you've got to be knowledgeable of the medical history of the student athlete. Does he have an IEP? Does he have an IMP? Um, if so, the school district may have additional duties when considering return to play. Uh, he, he may be protected by ADA, ADA laws that give him some rights, uh, may create a fiduciary relationship between the school and the student, but it's also a good idea to know whether or not he has any pre-existing either mental health issues or physiologic cognitive issues that may suggest that he's got some underlying pre-existing condition that if he's involved in a hit or a concussion, the consequences could be <coughs> devastating. And that was really what, what went on in the Stroh case. Stroh had um, a pre-existing brain lesion already to where when he did get hit, uh, that pre-existing condition was aggravated and he suffered a traumatic brain injury as a result. Um, foster an environment of open communication with other professionals and personnel within the chain of recognition and management of concussions, including parents, coaches, athletic trainers, and physicians, and teachers, even though they may have little direct contact with the athlete on the field. In Stro, when I said we deposed almost all the teachers in the Bedford Community School District, it was because our client had represented to a number of other people that he was having headaches, he was seen double, he uh, was dizzy, and interestingly, there were teachers to whom those complaints had been expressed. And that's important, even though these teachers, they weren't on the field, they, were, they had no real direct contact with any of the athletic activities, that he was involved in, they weren't aware about anything with respect to a prior concussion that, that our client had suffered. So they weren't a part of the dialogue, so to speak. Um, uh, certainly, certainly, um, I think that you, you, when you have, when you have the, the, the coaches, the athletic trainers, the physicians and the parents involved, that that should create a pretty tight nexus of where that student athlete is on the spectrum. I mean, I think that the, the communication has to be there. If a nurse, just let's, I'll give you a hypothetical here. Let's just say uh, student athlete uh, Mary presents to the nurse's office there, there have been no signs or symptoms or any activity in any of the athletic events that she'd been participating in. She shows up at the nurse's office and she's complaining of, head, of, of, of a bad headache. And she also uh, got a little bit of double vision. Uh, nurse looks at her pupils, finds they're a little bit abnormal, and gives her a couple of Tylenol, tells her to lay down and then get back up and no other history than that. That's not good communication. The nurse needs to ask her whether or not she's been involved in any kind of activity where she suffered a head injury or head trauma or anything of that so that the nurse now can begin to do his or her due diligence and rule out perhaps that she suffered a concussion or other injury at an athletic event that she was participating in and alert the coaches of that. So now that the coaches now know what's going on with her. So that communication has, has to exist. Um, again, the, the nexus should not just be the coaches and athletic trainers. It has to include everybody in that chain, everybody who would be involved with that particular student athlete. And then the last thing that I, that, I, that I think is always good is with everything in life, and it's no different in deciding whether or not, if you're a school district, do you return this athlete back to play? And what you've got to do is you've got to balance the risk versus the benefit of doing so. 
And if the balance is against returning that student athlete to play, then don't do it. You should have support of each one of one through six before you get to seven. And if you've got the support of one through six and you get to seven and you return that student athlete to play, that conduct, I think, under Iowa law today, will be judged reasonable. All right? Now, again, if you come down on the other side, that conduct, if you follow one through five, that conduct will be judged as reasonable. All right? Which means, in trial lawyer parlance, I'm not going to find a jury in hell to find in favor of my client. All right? So, today, the law is your a school district, your coach, your administrator, your athletic trainer, your physician, your nurse, you've got to act reasonable in accordance with the circumstances that exist at the time. What would a similar professional in my position do under these circumstances? And if you've followed one through six, then you should have a basis for support in your case. And for optimally supporting athletes. And for optimally support, supporting athletes, right. Because I think the science is it will, will evolve to a point where football looks a little bit different, soccer looks a little bit different. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it evolves like it. everything in life evolves. You know, coaches are, are teaching less, uh, well, they're teaching more body contact and less, you know, there, there's not head-to-head -head anymore. I mean, those things going on, are going on, and I think eventually, it may be a couple generations down the line, but you won't see head-to-head -head contact anymore in football. And, and that's my personal opinion, of course, I have no expertise in that. But uh, as a lawyer, I, I can tell you that the kind of case that I am looking for is where a coach, as in, as in the, uh, as in the Swank case, what happened in the, in the Swank case, that case happened not because the coach acted unreasonably in taking the student athlete out of the game and and reintroducing him. That case happened, I will tell you, because that coach grabbed this player by the face mask, man, face mask and shook it violently. And that kid went back in the game, even though there had been some uh, some other players that had said his, that had said his level of play had gone down uh, from the beginning of the game when he was initially when he was, or from an earlier game where he had been concussed. And they, of course, they put him through the protocol, and he was now ready to go back in. So the coach, the next game, and the coach put him back in, but his play was going down from the first to the second quarter, and the coach became a little frustrated with him, grabbed him by the helmet, mm -hmm. shook his helmet. Uh, kid uh, went home, died, dropped dead. Mm -hmm. And parents were devastated by that, but what really set him off was the conduct of the coach on the sideline where they had where the coach had, had just basically humiliated their son. And so there was no love lost after that. All the stops were pulled out. Um, but that's I, yeah I bring this this attempt to foster a concussion free environment. Coaches, uh, athletic trainers, assistant coaches, they can't they can't conceptually acknowledge that concussions occur in sports when there's helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact, and then foster an environment where you know kids are headbutting and you're throwing helmets down. You know the kid, the whole thing about kids throwing helmets down. The helmet doesn't break, <laughs> so I guess the the thought process is if the helmet doesn't break, right. I can do a helmet hit, and I'm not going to suffer a brain injury or a concussion. Yeah, I'm sorry. Question I had about fostering. Um, I've been through GMAX testing. Are you getting involved in any cases where they're, you know, we're in Iowa and the ground's hard and the ground causes about as many concussions as helmet to helmet does sometimes. You see all kinds of concussions where people fall and they hit 
their whole body weight's going down. The heads, you know, you get neck injuries too, but um, we're trying to test all of our playgrounds and practice fields because I'm responsible for that. If we're going to put kids out there, right. I'm responsible for that being safe. And it's right. not the cheapest thing in the world, and I wouldn't want money to determine it, but are you getting involved in any cases with the compaction of the ground or the fields? No, no, but but that not specifically with respect to that, but that always raises a question of supervision and surveillance, because if if you you can document and you can demonstrate that kids are taking hits to the head uh, when they're hitting the ground, then obviously uh, you know that's a factor to to be considered. However, it it. it you don't necessarily have to suffer a concussion as a result of a helmet helmet hit if you're a coach and you see a kid's falling down, a player's falling down, and hit his head on the on the ground, he, he jumps up and, and you think, boy, boy, he could suffer a concussion. You evaluate him, you gotta pull him out. Yeah. Uh, so it it's a fact. Yeah. So anyway, I'll wrap it up in question chat. Do you uh, recommend any changes to Iowa Law 2813 that would further provide guidelines to school districts on how to deal with the concussion or the strength of the law? Well, uh, it depends on what perspective. As a trial lawyer, I would I would love to have this statute be create a private cause of action. In other words, if you violate it, I don't have to go out and get an expert. I don't, I don't have to uh, interview 50 teachers. I don't have to interview coaches. I don't have to depose people. If you violated it, then I have a claim against you and I can, I can, I can recover damages as a trial lawyer. As, I, I, don't think you need to, I don't think you need to do that to strengthen the law. I think one of the things that can be done to strengthen this law is you mentioned a couple things about who evaluates on the field whether or not somebody has suffered a concussion or not. Who, who, what, what kind of do we do we really do we really want somebody that's not well trained uh, to do that? The other thing I think we can do, and this gets into the Good Samaritan laws is is um, we can require on a certain I, I think I think the Iowa statute would be would be bolstered if we required at at certain contests the presence of somebody trained in concussion recognition and evaluation that's not affiliated with the school district necessarily and is going to call it. Um, it is, is, is going to call it objectively. Um, of course, as technology advances, more and more of our games are videotaped and um, we have an opportunity to look back on those games and we can see whether or not, uh, you know, we can kind of do a, a quality assurance or a quality control or an audit control and look back on that game and see if a particular if, 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 a, if a play may have resulted in a concussion or not. Uh, I know more and more practices are being videotaped. Uh, I'm not saying, uh, believe me, I'm not trying to heap any unfunded mandates on educators, but if you want to strengthen the law and you want to prevent concussions, those are, those are ways, and I'm not talking about just concussions, I'm talking about successive concussive uh, acts that lead ultimately to to traumatic brain injuries, those are kinds of those are some of the things I think I think we can do to enhance the law. So, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> we'll meet back in the large room in a few minutes to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.